Good morning. We're coming to you from Doers of the Word Baptist Church this morning at 9975 Kinsman Road in Novelty, Ohio. If you'd like to write us, our zip code is 44072. Uh, this morning we have uh, celebrity preacher John McTurnan, who is going to be uh, preaching the morning message. And Big John, as he's called, was the co-founder of Christ, Cops for Christ International and also... He has authored of many books. He is a very, very well-known, nationally known speaker, debater. He has debated uh, the very best debaters uh, that the Muslims or the Orthodox Jews have. And uh, John is, is very, very skilled uh, in God's Word, the Bible. Mm -hmm. I wanted to just say here this morning, and he's going to be preaching on some prophecy. I have some articles that I wanted to hit just very quickly to show you a little bit about the times we're living in. You see here, here's a, a picture here with three posters, posters that are made about abomination, the man of sin. Uh, the first one here you see the Bible and the picture of abomination with the Bible open. And the headlines is that prophecy is being fulfilled. The Messiah is here. And uh, Florida A&M professor Barbara Thompson she published a book called The Gospel According to Apostle Barak. The book uh, likens uh, Obama to Jesus Christ and Martin Luther King. I learned that Jesus walked the earth to create a more civilized society. Martin Luther King walked the earth to create a more justified society. But Apostle Barak, the name was called, was, he was called in my dreams, would walk the earth to create a more equalized society. For the middle class and the working poor, she wrote in an excerpt published by the Daily Caller. Well, this is exactly the type of thing. Karl Marx, uh, when they came out, liberation theology is the combination, the marriage, if you will, of cultural Marxism with the teachings of Christ were in total opposition. Then the next one you see, is a picture of Newsweek magazine that was on the cover of Barack Hussein Obama, this man of sin. And it says, the second coming. This is, we told you back in uh, 2004, or 2008 rather, that, that I believe this man, if he wasn't the Antichrist, he was a good runner-up. He has every single attribute, every single characteristic of the Antichrist, and his name is in the Bible. Now, then the last picture you see here is a picture of Barack upon the cross being crucified in front of the national uh, seal. Okay, so Barack is hanging abomination from the cross, and then you've got these people down mourning his. Him. Folks, again, this is blasphemy, and it's blasphemy, and it's blasphemy. I wanted to say this very quickly. Next thing here is the shock claim. Obama wants only military leaders who will fire on U.S. citizens. That's the litmus test now. That's been the test, folks. We've been telling you about it, and it's here now. They're, they're admitting to it now. They're admitting to it now. Okay. The next one I wanted to show you very quickly is what the devil, scientist tap power of Lucifer. Lucifer, nobody believes humans are more intelligent than life in this gallery. Nobody believes that humans are the only intelligent life in this gallery. In other words, to make this short, uh, they have this huge, more, the most powerful telescope ever, and uh, the, uh, it's put out, and, and the Vatican is involved with this, but the name of this telescope is called Lucifer. Lucifer. This new. And uh, remember, Lucifer means a light bearer. Okay. So uh, these are the days we're living in. For those that have eyes to see, ears to hear, try to understand. The vast majority of the world out there, they're totally oblivious. They're in la-la land. And with that, I want to turn it over to John McTurney. Praise the Lord. I'm delighted to be here at Doers of the Word. I've been here quite a few times, Chris Ernie. Not enough. Not, oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's the opposite of one church I got thrown out of. <laughs> In Baltimore. The, 
they invited me to speak, and that was, not, they said, get out. We don't want to hear you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got thrown out of the church. Yeah. Wow. Uh -huh. In fact, the, usher, the elder came up and said, you're not leaving fast enough. Get out. <laughs> oh. Yeah, got thrown out. But praise the Lord. I was preaching the truth. They didn't want to hear it. Yeah. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I have a, I sort of, I've been thinking about the message to give. It's going to be in three segments. I want to give... Um, I want to speak first about uh, this book that I wrote. It's about my dad. This is the anniversary of his passing. Mm -hmm. And I want to share a testimony because I believe it's very important that you hear what happened with my dad. I brought copies if you if you'd be interested in it. I want to talk about current events, what's happened literally this week. And we'll talk about Hurricane Sandy mm -hmm. that hit New York. And then we want to talk about 1 Thessalonians 5 and the day of the Lord and what the Bible tells us about the day of the Lord. So let me open with a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for this time. We thank you for everybody that's here. We thank you for Pastor Ernie and his boldness and faithfulness. And everybody that went to the march, Lord, we put, just send your blessings out. The Bible says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So I'm asking now that everybody's faith is going to be built uh, as a result of this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, my dad... Uh, Everything that's in the book is true about him. I didn't make anything up. He's like a novel. He's like a, a character from a novel. And when he passed away, uh, the events that had transpired immediately uh, with his passing, I wasn't um, sad. It was a very strange feeling. Uh, the Lord worked so dramatic in his life. It was like, I'm going to share things that are like literally miracles that happened. So I want to share about him. Every time I share, I give my father's testimony, good things happen. People get saved, people get um, delivered, and people get set free and all. So I'm hoping that that will happen if anybody needs it here and who's ever, who's ever watching. I want to give a couple little backgrounds about him. And I want to zero in on the last four days of his life and what happened. Um, my dad is from uh, originally from Ireland, and he came over when he was about 20. And in his youth in Ireland... Uh, it was extremely poor, and he had, uh, there was a farm, his grandfather's farm was about three or four miles from his farm, and every day uh, he'd have to run there from when he was like 12 years old to, I, I don't know, to almost he left Ireland, to, to, they had some cattle, so he would get up in the morning and he'd run three miles and run back barefoot, he didn't have shoes, and then sometimes at lunch he'd have to check on the cattle. So every day he would run between 12 and 18 miles barefoot. Um, and I, I knew my dad, I'm going to tell you about his strength, but in 2005 I went to Ireland and I went to the old homestead and I met his uh, lifetime friend, his friend from growing up. And he started to tell me all these stories about my dad. And one of them he said that he was at least three times stronger than any man. That as a 15-year-old, he picked up this farm equipment that it take two or three men to pick up. Now, when you seen him, he was extremely skinny. He's six. He's my height, but he looked like he weighed 120 pounds. But he actually was like 180, 85 pounds. So he looked really skinny. And when I was, uh, my mother and father were divorced, and I was raised by my mother. But when I was with my father, we'd meet, we'd meet friends of his or coworkers, and, and they all had a story about my dad. Best friend, they'd say. Kid, your dad's the strongest man I've ever met. And I'd look at him, and he was skinny like this. Dad, your, your kid, your dad's the fastest runner that we've ever seen. Uh, he was the best shot. He was an incredible hunter, um, uh, horseman with horses. I write about it all in, in the book here. I want to give you three stories well, about his strength, and then I just so you can see how unusual he was. Then I want to get into the testimony of the last couple days of his life, which are just absolutely incredible. I, uh, growing up as a big kid, uh, lifting weights and playing football and all that, it, it's a man thing. I don't know, around 16, 17, I started, somehow one day we started to wrestle, me and my dad. I got a quick lesson. It was like wrestling a bear. <laughs> I understood when they said, kid, you're the st you're, you're, your dad's the strongest man. He's built like you. Not that you're that... You know, but I mean not to have that strength that he had. So I would wrestle with him, and it was uh, like I was a little baby. Uh, absolutely nothing. I couldn't, uh, 
once he got his hands on me, it was all over. I would run at him like a football tackle, and he'd stop me as I was, and he'd stop me, and he'd laugh at me, and just throw me to the side, <laughs> like it was nothing. Oh, I was helpless. I, he had the strength of a bear. And then when we wrestled, his way of, uh, of uh, defeating me was to get me down on the ground. He'd wrap his legs around my chest in a, with his feet like that. It's called a scissor hold. Oh, yeah. And I knew he could crush my rib cage. I knew it with the power he had. So he made me hollow mama. <laughs> I'm talking about being humiliated. I go, Mama, that's not loud enough. Mama, it's still not. Mama, mama, mama. That's it, son. That's it. So I, I, I never felt any strength like this. My father, the strength he had was freakish. So um, uh, there was a uh, professional fighter. He was a member of, the, of my mother's side of the family. He was a light heavyweight. He was 17-0, and 0, and he fought at Madison Square Garden. And he picked a fight with my dad one day, and it was the wrong thing to do. <laughs> and he ended up unconscious, uh, bloodied, uh, taken to the hospital. And it was a family type of feud, and uh, my father was taken and put, the guy lied, and my father was taken and put in jail for months because he couldn't meet bail. And uh, I heard, he never talked about it, but I heard stories about it from actually my grandmother. And he absolutely, the professional fighter picked a fight with him and sucker punched him. And my father was finished with him. It was, <laughs> I mean, he nearly killed the guy. That's, that was the power of my father. He was not a professionally trained fighter. But this professionally trained fighter could not stand up to my father. Yeah, I got a call from him one night. Oh, yeah. I was about... 16, 17, and he was coming home from work, and he had a he had his little beagle dog, and the dog tipped him off that something was wrong. There was cars along the street. The dog was acting funny. So my my father's telling me on the phone, the dog saved my life, but they stabbed the dog. They stabbed the dog. What happened was two muggers came out to mug my father. They looked at he was probably about that time about 50. And he looked, you know, he looked easy as a as a, as a mugger. Big mistake. My dad would never back down. And the dog went after one mugger, and she got stabbed. This dog got stabbed, but she lived. But it kept the, the, the second mugger away. The first came at him with a knife. My father got his hands on him. And I knew. <laughs> when my father was telling me, I said, oh, man, that mugger was in terror. <laughs> and he, so I, my dad said he took the knife off him. And I said, what happened, Dad? He said, well, he wasn't moving when I finished with him. <laughs> he said he was laying on the street like this, and he wasn't moving. I don't know if he was alive or not, because I'm telling him, my, the power of my father it was incredible. So about two weeks later, he calls me again. And he said, i got to move. They know where I live. And what happened was the, the mugger that, the second mugger, had apparently followed my father to where he lived in an apartment building. Mm -hmm. And the dog was sniffing at, at the door. And my dad knew there was some trouble behind the door. So he opened the door and he tells me, he put his shoulder to it and rammed the door closed, and the mugger was trapped behind the door in the wall. <laughs> so my dad's explaining how he, he said, oh, I gave him the works. I, was this. I gave him the works, and the dog runs around and is chewing the guy's leg. And that's the, dog, that's the guy that stabbed the dog two weeks earlier. So that's, my father says to me, well, when I was convinced he was unconscious, I opened the door, and he falls down. And he said, there was this big, like, machete. The guy had a big machete in his hand. So he says to me, uh, I got to move. They're going to kill me. They're going to kill me. I got to move. So he carried the guy down. He did five flights up. He carried him down to the landing in the apartment building and left him there. So I said, well, Dad, didn't you call the police? He goes, nah, the beating was sufficient, son. <laughs> the beating was sufficient. <laughs> That's my dad. So he's 72 years old, 73 years old. He lived upstate New York, and I go to visit. Now, this is my stepmother, but I refer to him as my mother. My mother said, did you hear about your dad getting arrested? I said, no, but what happened? He said, tell, tell him, pointed to my father, tell him. So my dad put his head down like this. <laughs> he wouldn't tell me, so she told me. And uh, uh, my dad liked to gamble on the horses. It was called off-track betting in New York. 
So he says to my mother, stop at OTB, I want to place a bet. So she was driving and she stops. And he goes in, he said, I'll be right out. And like, he doesn't come out. And all of a sudden, two state trooper cars pull up. And they go in. So she's waiting, she's a little curious. And she, go, she goes in and here my dad's sitting in a chair handcuffed, like this. And they they've got his wallet and they're looking at his driver's license and the troopers are laughing. And there's a guy across the room sitting in a chair and they go over and they show him the license. So it turns out he's 25 years old and they, they're pointing to him. They go like this, no, no, no. The guy goes like this, no, no, no. So they come back and they take the cuffs off my hand, off my dad's hand and they said, he's not going to, I'll tell you what happened. He goes, he's not going to press charges because he's ashamed to, he was beat up by a 75-year-old man. <laughs> so what happened was, my dad's at this table, and this guy's smoking. And he's, he's blowing the smoke in my father's face. So dad said, please stop. So the guy comes around, he goes right in my father's face, and he goes, <sighs> like that wrong thing to do. <laughs> so <laughs> my father said, son, I just got mad, I'm sorry, but he said, I gave him a right, and he fell at my feet unconscious like a sack of potatoes. <laughs> so I said, Dad, you know, you're 75 now. Don't you think you should hang up the gloves? I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it. It was like a reflex. But that's the power of my dad at 75. One punch, and this guy is out. And the guy didn't want to press charges because he was too embarrassed to go to jail, to go to court and admit he was beat up by a 75-year-old man. That's just a handful of stories. I mean, the book is full of stories. In fact, at, at, the, uh, at the funeral, that my, the, his grandkids, my kids and my wife, they said, you got to write. you got to write the story of the kids about Grandpa. you got to write this. So I did. Um, I, the sad thing about my dad is I could never talk to him about the Lord. You know, early on I tried, and he, he got mocking. He would mock, so I stopped. For decades I didn't really talk to him about the Lord. I, the only thing he would, I would tell him was John 3.16. He let me tell him John 3.16. But I started to talk to him about anything. So, and he was getting sicker and sicker. He was uh, almost 95. And, uh, you know, I knew the end was coming. And this was a tremendous weight on me uh, about, about his condition, his spiritual condition. Mm -hmm. So uh, he had a, his lungs were really bad, and he was, in a, he was on a, a ventilator. And I was talking to the doctor, and she said, we're going to give him a couple days, but we'll have to take, he was unconscious, we're going to have to, we'll give him a week, but I, I don't really give you much hope. So my, my mother, I told her I would go home and I would come back when they were going to take the ventilator off. And she said, okay. And if you looked at him, his hands were all, arms were all swollen like this. His feet were swollen. His eyes were all sunken in his head. And I didn't know what to do, so I prayed. And then I stood over him like this just before I left. And I couldn't think. I said, Lord, Roman. All I did was I quoted John 3.16. I, I, I must six, eight, ten times. John 3.16, John 3.16. And I left. A couple days later, my mother calls me all excited, and she said, I forgot about you. I forgot about you. The doctor said there's no hope. He, he, he can't. His lungs are gone. Uh, we're taking the, the tube out now. That's like a five-hour drive from where I lived to where he was. Mm. She said, you better get here right away. So I jump in the car, and I head up to Albany, New York. And uh, uh, I, when I got at the, in the hospital, I didn't know if he'd be alive. I expected him to be in a bed, like unconscious. So I walk into the emergency room where he was, and at the distance I'm looking, and here he is sitting up in the bed. And my father had the most beautiful blue eyes you've ever seen. And I could, from the distance, I could see his eyes. And his arms, were, the swelling was almost all gone. And he looks at me, and he calls me Johnny. He goes, Johnny, 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 I knew you'd come. I knew you'd come. I was I, I, speechless. So I come around the bed like this, and I'm looking at him, and he says, uh, I said to him, it's a miracle, Dad. And he goes, Jesus loves me. So here I am, but I'm swallowing my tongue. I mean, I thought it was, I was hearing things. I said, Jesus loves you? Yes, he loves me, and I love him. And uh, I said, Dad, is Jesus your Savior? Of course he's my Savior. 
I said, Dad, did he did he die on the cross? And he acted like I was stupid. Goes, of course he died. He loves me. And I love him. He died on the cross for me. I mean, it was like a dream to me. It was like, this can't be. When I left, he was almost like dead. And now I see him. He's praising the Lord. So um, I said, uh, do you have assurance of eternal life with Jesus? He goes, of course. He died for me. He loves me. He loves me. And he's going, I'm a new man. I'm a new man inside. There's power inside me. There's power inside me. So the doctor was the same doctor I had seen. She's on the outs She's outside the room. She calls me out. So I come out and she said, I, I, I can't explain this about your father. She said, what happened was when we took the tube out, he went into a catatonic state. And she said he laid looking at the ceiling for about an hour. And she said, we used pain, stimulus, and everything. He didn't respond. And she said, when he came out of it, he's acting like this. <laughs> he had some encounter with the Lord. I believe he heard me saying John 3.16 to him. That's what I believe. And all he wants to talk about is Jesus' love. And Jesus is Savior. And it spread amongst his friends and all, because everybody thought he was going to die. And now they didn't really know the spiritual implications. But they see how, he didn't look 95, he looked 70. And he looked absolutely wonderful. And all he wanted to talk about was God's love. God's love. So the, the, another doctor calls me over and my mother, and he, they're going to put him in a hospice. So he, the doctor's there, I'm here, my mother's over here, and he's talking very calmly to me. And he says, he points to me, and he goes, if I was to take your CO2 reading right now, it would probably be 30 to 35. He opens the chart to my father, and he, incredulously he says, your father's is 135. He can't be alive. You can't be alive with a CO2 level like this. I, I, I said, well, and he said, it's the lowest since he's been here. It's even been higher. And I said, well, how much longer does he have to live, doctor? He said, not a minute. He's dead. <laughs> you can't be alive like this. See, I believe he was alive by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Right. And the doctor was telling me, he can't be alive. He said, and then I asked some other doctors. They said, you're unconscious or dead at, at 100 CO2 level. Never mind my dad's one. Third. That's what he said. The doctor said, I've never seen a CO2 level like this. Mm. And my father, if you were this far away, Pastor Ernie, you could hear his lungs. You hear this wheezing and cracking. Mm -hmm. And when he started to say, I'm a new man inside, the, the room would be filled with his voice. You, you, there's no way you could explain the power in his lungs from the way he was breathing. So um, I, I decided to go home. And my wife was coming with the uh, with the grandkids like the next day or the day after, so I, I decided to go home. And the way we greeted each other, me and my dad, <laughs> with a, instead of shaking hands or that, we'd always be getting a fighting position like this, and we growl at each other in fake punches. And that's the way we greeted each other. <laughs> so he's la he's laying in the bed, and. Uh, I came over him like this, and I said, get up, I'm not afraid of you. <laughs> so he put his fists up, and I, I started to laugh, and I was looking at his eyes, and I said, is Jesus Christ your Savior? And he put his fists down, and he looked at me, and he went, Jesus Christ is my Savior. So I walked to the end of the bed, and I'm looking at him, and I said, I looked at him, and he said, Jesus Christ is my Savior. So I went to the door, my mother was there, and she said, I'll be out in a couple minutes. And I turned, and I looked. And he looked at me, and he, we looked each other right in the eye, and he said, Jesus Christ is my Savior. And I said, Dad, that's the best thing I ever heard. Amen. I'm going down the hall, and I hear, Jesus Christ is my Savior. I get to the nurse's station. This is a man that can't breathe. This is a man with a CO2 level of 135. His lungs are cracking and wheezing and making all sorts of weird noise. You can hear it. Ten, not ten. Five feet from him, you can hear his lungs. I get to the elevator. I can hear, Jesus Christ is my Savior. <laughs> <laughs> so my mother, I, I go to the car and she, she said, did you hear your father carrying on? She said, he was, Jesus is my savior. He said, he kept that up the whole time he was yelling and had his hands up in the air like this. So two days later, he, he did pass away. He just um, kind of went into like, in the morning, went into unconsciousness. And then in the evening, he passed away. And because of that 
encounter I had and this miraculous thing the Lord did, I, the sting of death was gone. It really was. It really was. And to top it all off, uh, the Catholic priest came and um, uh, the funeral was going to be in the Catholic Church. So I told the priest I wanted to give the eulogy and he said, sure, go ahead. So when I gave the eulogy, I preached the gospel to my whole family, and the priest was right behind me, right there. I preached the gospel by his testimony. That's all I did, was I gave the testimony of my father. And the priest is right behind me, and I looked at everybody in there, and I said, I know that my father's in heaven because of his testimony of Jesus Christ as his Savior. And of course, they have uh, purgatory and all that stuff. So I said, I know he's in heaven. Uh, so it's all in this book. And the, the, the book ends with how to heal the brokenhearted. And my dad did have a broken heart for a lot of reasons. But at the end, his heart was solid with the Lord. The Lord completely healed him. And oh, one other thing about him was when you were in his presence, he was literally a beacon of love. You could feel it. There was like, it, was, it, was like, it was like a vessel of love, the Holy Spirit was just pouring out of me. It actually, I, I, it's strange, I can't explain it, but you could feel it. I could actually, it was very pleasant to be in his presence with this love that was, and he wanted to tell everybody about love. The nurses would come, I love you, I love you. I thought he was flirting a little, but no, it really wasn't. It was this, he just wanted to tell everybody about God's love. So here is a man that I couldn't talk to about the Lord, my dad. I couldn't. Four days, he was almost 95 years old. Four days before he died, look what God did. I'm a new man inside. I'm a new man. There's power inside me. The love that was coming through. His body, he was like, Dad, the doctor told me. He didn't have a minute to live. You can't live like this. Praising the Lord with power and boldness. So I want to encourage everyone that's been praying for you know, your parents, your kids for years. You haven't seen any results. I mean, you can, I can only tell you what happened in my case with my dad. And also, uh, the broken hearted. Luke 4.18 says that Jesus Christ came to heal the brokenhearted. Amen. And then all that my, my dad had with that broken heart, all those years in his life, in one, I don't know, minute, one hour, whatever the Lord did that in that when he was in that catatonic state, when he came out of it, it was all healed. I'm a new man inside. There's power inside me. So that's what God can do. Amen. It can be years of, um, of built up sin. Of who knows what's inside, and like that, God can move and heal. And he, he, he moved and healed my God, my father's broken heart. So again, it's all in the book, especially about the last chapter. I recommended about Jesus Christ coming to heal the brokenhearted. Isn't it nice to have a testimony like that? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. And I'm surprised I didn't cry because I usually <laughs> cry when I when I give his. He he was a character. I'm telling you, he was. There was no one else like him. Um, to switch gears now, I want to talk about what's happened in the last uh, couple weeks. Well, now, actually in uh, October, November, and then I want to talk about what happened last week with uh, Obama. I want to go back to Hurricane Sandy that hit New York. Now, if you follow my ministry, and I have it here in my book, As America's Done to Israel, what I'm about to say is not an isolated incident. This is a pattern that's been going on for decades that when God interferes with Israel, not God, when the United States interferes with Israel or we promote national sin, like abortion or homosexuality, things happen at the time we're doing it. So if, if you haven't heard this, I'm not cherry picking. This, I just, I'm, I want to talk about what happened current. But in my book, you can see that I go back, well, in the case of. Israel, I go back to the great hurricane of 1938 to have in the United States to show it's tied in to what we were doing to the Jews. But um, uh, Hurricane Sandy hit New York now and, uh, and New Jersey. It was um, the worst natural disaster ever to hit New York, and it was a freakish storm. Mm -hmm. right. um, and I, I did study the meteorology on this, and it's really, it was a unique storm because over Greenland, there was a high pressure area. Right. that didn't move, it just sat there, mm -hmm. a, a massive high pressure area. And all these storm patterns 
they're running into this high pressure area and they're stopping. So one hits and it stops, the next one hits and it stops, but it's backing up. Mm -hmm. You follow me? Right. And it's right. backing up and backing up to the United States. Mm -hmm. And finally, the last storm hits like, we'll say, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Long Island there. And it's like this, this big, huge storm uh, chain that stopped. Mm -hmm. So as Hurricane Sandy comes up, it can't turn like they normally do and go out into the Atlantic because all these storms are there. Right. And there is uh, a, a low pressure of all places over Ohio. Oh, yeah. See what you guys did? <laughs> yeah. So as Hurricane Sandy comes up, the only place it can do is make a left-hand turn and head inland, like towards Ohio, where the other low pressure is. It draws it like that. Mm -hmm. That's why the hurricane made that left-hand turn and hit like, the, like Jersey head-on. New Jersey head-on. Right. But the worst place of a hurricane is to the right of the eye. Yes. So that's why it sent that powerful surge to New York, because New York was on the right side of the eye. Exactly. So it was this bizarre weather pattern that happens once every 100, 200 years to set this up. Mm -hmm. it, it, again, it was the, the worst hurricane ever to hit New Jersey, the worst ever to hit New York. Now, there's more powerful ones, but the size of this, the magnitude, and it sent this tremendous storm surge up into New York City, into Long Island, and New Jersey, the coast of New Jersey. Now, while the storm is heading towards New York, Hurricane Sandy, it's coming up the coast. The mayor of New York City, Bloomberg, is in Maryland promoting homosexual marriage. It was on the uh, ballot. He donated a hundred and no, five hundred thousand of his own money to promote uh, homosexual marriage. So the hurricane is heading to New York, his city, literally, while he's promoting homosexual marriage. Oh. Do I hear a coincidence anyway? Oh. No. The New York State had passed homosexual marriage. Yes. Um, three days before the hurricane hit, the Supreme Court of New York State made its final ruling uh, rejecting any objections to um, homosexual marriage. And they said that they would not entertain any more legal challenges. That it was sealed, it was a done deal in New York State. The governor came out and also the, and by the way, the governor of New York runs about 70% popularity. The governor came out and said how wonderful this was, that, that now that the homosexuals can get married and there's no more challenges. The state attorney general came out, that was Governor Cuomo, I don't know the attorney general's name. And he issued this declaration. By everything, I'm, by, by the way, everything I'm telling you is on my blog. The quotes from Governor Cuomo, the quotes from the Attorney General, the timing. Blumberg in, in Maryland. Obama, while he was campaigning, uh, he, he took some side issues for homosexual marriage. It wasn't a national issue. It was a local issue in Maryland, Maine, and Washington. So the week before the election, he was in, I think, Maryland, he was also promoting homosexual marriage, and I believe he, if he, I don't know if he was in Maine or not, but he was promoting it in these three states, <laughs> encouraging it to homosexual, homosexual marriage. So while that is all going on, Hurricane Sandy slams into New York. <coughs> while that Supreme Court was making the decision in New York, and while Cuomo was praising it, and while the Attorney General of New York was praising it, the hurricane was heading right towards <coughs> that state. Right towards it. So I put this on my blog. And I don't know how this happened, but it went viral. I mean, it was all over the world. I was uh, uh, Huffington Post, one of the largest uh, sites. It had me there, like front page on it. Of course, they're all mocking. Right. Yeah. You know, it was on uh, it was on the Israeli uh, front page, the London Times, and all this. Uh, fundamentalist preacher <laughs> says this and that, but they accurately quoted me. They accurately, and I'm going, praise the Lord, how could I ever get this out? Right? Yes, Amen. Yes, Amen. They were mocking me, but they didn't misquote me. <laughs> and I was tying it to the perfect storm in 1991, how the weather patterns had happened and all this and that. So I began to get emails and um, uh, comments on my blog and uh, easily Easily, 
1,500, 2,000. Uh, a lot of them were vile, but it was from homosexuals all over the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, Australia, Belgium, England, uh, I, all over the world. And I had a routine of giving them scriptures. Mm -hmm. I had a, a routine answer. So here I'm looking at it. I said, Lord, how would I ever be able to reach homosexuals like this? So God sent them to me. <laughs> God sent them to me. So, you know, there was all sorts of vile stuff, and they accused me of being this, that, and the other thing. But I, I sent them all like Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Every one of them got that. Or I would, uh, they'd say they were born that way, and I would give them uh, 1 Corinthians 6, uh, 9 through 12, about uh, some, and such were some of you, and it lists like fornicators, effeminate, abusers of themselves, of mankind, adulterers, drunkards. I'd say, no, you're not born that way, and the gospel of Jesus Christ can deliver you. Amen. So, That's right. I, I, I had a, I won't know, I, can, I, I, I don't know if you could say a wonderful time, but a unique time of reaching homosexuals all over the world with the gospel. So I could, how am I going to do it on my own? So but the Lord had them sent to me. Mm -hmm. So they tried to persecute me with this attack on what I wrote and what I said on my blog. And I ended up preaching the gospel through it. Oh, amen. So praise the Lord. Amen. Right? Amen. Amen. God uses everything for his glory. So what they thought they were doing, making a fool of me, God was actually using them to preach the gospel. Had them in derision. Had them in derision. Now, um, I, I listened to Pastor Ernie and everybody going uh, um, Friday to uh, the, uh, the March for Life, and it was one that was edifying for me. I was following it on World Net Daily. They had some real, right, not real nice write-ups, mm -hmm. Pastor Ernie, about it. So I didn't know Fox News covered it, but I was following it on World Net Daily. And uh, I want to refresh you what happened last week. Because uh, we have been issued, the United States has been issued uh, the sternest warning from the Lord that you can imagine. That the, the neck of the United States is on the chopping block for judgment. Uh, God burns nations by fire that promote homosexuality. And all you got to do is look at Genesis 19 for that. Um, on Monday, uh, the President of the United States... Uh, gave his second inaugural address, and in it he quoted the Declaration of Independence that uh, all men are created equal, and that we have inalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And he said, if all men are created equal, then homosexuals are homosexual love is equal too. See, they're created. And uh, what he did was he defiled. Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, he defiled like American history, mm -hmm. and as the President of the United States, he exalted homosexuality. Well, he did. Uh, I don't have time to go into this right now, but God judges nations when they, when, when that nation makes sin an ordinance. Amen. An ordinance. See, Pastor Ernie, it's not that God judges nations when homosexuals commit that act. He'll judge them individually. But when a nation makes it legal, that's when the judgment comes. And it's called an ordinance in the Bible. And the ordinance can also, it's a custom or a law. So like um, Gay Pride Day, that is an ordinance as far as God is concerned. Uh, Maryland passing uh, homosexual marriage, that is an ordinance. Uh, having homosexuality in the military, that is an ordinance. And the list goes on and on and on. This is what God judges a nation for oh. when it makes sin a custom, when it makes it a law, right. when it in, in, in makes it like a cap in, in the mainstream. It I guess that would be the best way, which the United <laughs> States has done. Uh, I knew we were in trouble when he did that uh, in his inauguration, and what he connected when he con connected all men created equal. Uh, to homosexuality, uh, I knew that we were going to hear from heaven on this. Oh, yeah. I knew we were. That was Monday. On Tuesday, uh, Obama came out and sent uh, four, it was a four, but there's 20 of our top yeah. F-16 fighters to Egypt. 
Egypt is in, under the control now of the Muslim Brotherhood, which is a terrorist organization. That's right, of course. The Muslim Brotherhood uh, has sworn to destroy Israel. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Morsi, who was the president of Egypt, has come out and called the Jews um, pigs and apes. Yeah. And the reason he did that is because that's what the Koran says. He was only quoting the Koran. And then he said, I was misquoted by the Jewish media in the United States. How do you misquote pigs and apes? In June, and I, again, I posted this on my blog, in June, Morsi was running for um, uh, the presidency of Egypt, and he was at a political rally in the north of Egypt, and it, it, it was, uh, the speaker was his imam, the the, the well, imam is what it is, what he is. And he was the top imam of the Muslim Brotherhood. So he's speaking where I am, and Morsi is right there. You could see it. In the camera, you could see it. And this imam went off, and he said that uh, Morsi is going to lead us for the Islamic Caliphate. And that this caliphate, is the capital is not going to be Cairo, but the capital is going to be Jerusalem. And he said, we're coming, you Jews. He goes, you're not going to be able to sleep at night. He right. said, fear us, we're coming. And he said, brandish your weapons and say your prayers. The martyrs are heading towards Jerusalem or we're going to die on the way. That's what he said. That was June. On Tuesday, Obama sends this man four F-16s uh, with more coming. He's sending them 200 Abrams tanks. Our top-of-the-line tanks, our top-of-the-line fighters, who is Egypt going to fight? Why does Egypt need these planes? Against the Sudan? No. Against Libya? Like who? Israel. Right. That's why he sent them. See, Obama is not taking Israel head on anymore. He's going back door. He's building up Israel's enemies. He sure is. You understand? He's putting us in direct judgment with the God of Israel for doing this. Direct judgment. So that's Monday, that's Tuesday, right? On Thursday, North Korea announces that it's going to set off a, its third nuclear bomb, that it's perfecting its missiles for all-out war against the United States. It's coming. That they're going to nuke us. Yeah. Oh, my. I believe it, folks. I believe God has warned us this week what's coming. We've exalted homosexuality as a nation. We're building up Israel's enemies. And within two days after doing that, North Korea says, United States, we're coming for you. They've, they have the missiles already. And they have the nuclear weapon. The problem is uh, accuracy and the, getting the nuclear bomb small enough to fit the warhead so they can get us. That's what they're working on right now. Oh. And openly said it. Huh? The leader of North Korea said, no one's stopping us. We, we're going to have another underground explosion. We're building the missiles for all-out war with the United States. Oh, my God. Oh. And how does God judge nations that promote homosexuality like we're doing? Fire. With fire. Mm -hmm. With fire. This is not speculation, folks. This is not like it might happen. They're working day and night to do it. They'll starve all their... They are doing it. They're starving their people to death to funnel all the money into building the missiles and the nuclear weapons. And they're saying, we're doing it, America. We're going to use them on you. And all they, all they have to do is get one nuclear bomb and set it about 30, 40 miles over the west coast of the United States. And it sends out what's called an EMP blast. And it fries all the computers, electronic diodes, and things like that. So you have everything from Mexico to Canada to the Rocky Mountains fried. We would go back to like 1850 as a nation. We couldn't survive that. That's all they have to do is get one. That is. Or if they get five or six, and they want to drop one on Los Angeles, one on San Francisco, one on Portland, one on uh, Seattle. And they don't have to be a powerhouse like uh, China or the Soviet Union. If they've got those nuclear weapons and they've got the missiles, they could do it. Folks, God has warned us this week 
where the judgment is coming and what we're being judged for. It's right there. So in Scripture, when, when God says, like, I'll destroy nations from certain sins, for certain sins, it's not like uh, poetic. You know, it's not like, wow, that's, that's Old Testament stuff, we'll say that. That's, that's literal. There's blessings and curses in His Word. Amen. And any nation that goes down the road that we're going down will get judgment. And Pastor Ernie, you were up here talking, and where is it from the pulpit? There's just a handful. Right. And I'm, I'm thankful for the handful of preachers like Pastor Ernie that will, and, and the radio show and all. But there's no, there's no thunder from the pulpits anymore. And the more we go into sin, the more sheepish they get from the pulpits, it seems. Right. We don't want to offend any. That's political. But what's God say? What does He say about it? I mean, it's, it's like the fear of man. Well, I might be called names. Well, Jesus Christ is called names. Right? right? I mean, you can't take a little buffing from sin, rebuffing from sinners out there? They cursed the Lord, didn't they? And are, are, we, are we a disciple of if, if we name the name of Jesus? And you mentioned all they that uh, are in Christ Jesus, so suffer persecution. Amen. And I mean, if you're not willing to suffer persecution, then go out and do something else. Amen. But where is the fire from the pulpits? Amen. Pastor Ernie, I believe that many of them can't get the fire. They've been spiritually anesthetized because of the NIV and these other. There isn't power in that, Pastor. That's right. That's one of the reasons why there's no power from the pulpits. They don't have the Word of God. That's right. God's not bearing witness to what the, the translations they're using. Amen. How can God bear witness to the NIV when it leaves out that the Lord's the only begotten Son of God? How can He bear witness with it? That's not God's Holy Spirit. So here we are, folks. We're, we're, we're except for the remnant that's crying and interceding, and maybe God will hear us. But the United States is its head is on the chopping block now of judgment. When the president in his inaugural address linked homosexuality to the Declaration of Independence, that was it. And when he sent those top top line weapons to Egypt, that was it. And the Lord said, "Here's North Korea. Now you're gonna have to deal with North Korea." And day and night they're working with the missiles and the nuclear weapons, the nukes. It says, and the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Mm -hmm. Does God want to do this? No. He's waiting for His people. Amen. This is not a game. This is not a, God's not into religious games. You know, this is not a game. This is serious. This is life and death. There's heaven and hell. And there's, there's the existence of nations have been destroyed for the road that they have gone down with sin. So, uh, I want to leave that with you, and hopefully it may raise up prayer and intercession and crying out to God on my Block Talk Radio. Thursday nights is our prayer night, and we intercede before the Lord for issues like this uh, every Thursday night. We cry out for God's mercy in our land. Okay, how much time do I have left? Much as you want. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> That's a, he's a better man yet. I was crying before because they said 45 minutes. You just keep preaching. Okay. You're almost an hour now. Really? That's an hour already? You got about 23 minutes. I got 23 minutes left? Yeah. We had it on. Talk to this guy over here. <laughs> okay. I want you to turn to 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5. And we're going to talk about the day of the Lord. Um, and <coughs> when you study scriptures, uh, I, I, my ministry is defend and proclaim the faith. And one of the issues that I do get into is prophecy. And uh, I, I understand that not all the scripture is prophecy. And uh, But a lot of people that I run into, they don't care at all. The book of Revelation is too confusing, and I'm not interested in prophecy. Well, why did God give, like, 25% of the Bible's prophecy? Mm -hmm. Right? right? Mm -hmm. Excuse 27 me? Plus. 27 plus. About 25. <laughs> yeah. And of that prophecy, 
a high percentage of it is about the day of the Lord. Amen. Amen. So, to me, it's not filler. God has put it there for a reason. Amen. If there's so, if there's so much uh, uh, of it in, 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 the, uh, in the Bible like that. And um, when we go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1, Paul says here, But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. Now, when you go back into the book of Acts, and the problem here is I have a, it's really a brand new Bible. It's a nice big print and all, but I don't have it marked up like my other Bible. In my other Bible, I'd turn to Acts right away, and I'd say, well, here's the verse. Uh, and I can't do that right now. Um, so I'm stumbling around here. Uh, okay, it's in verse 7. Acts, uh, Acts 1, uh, verse 7. Now, and uh, they asked the Lord about when he was going to restore the kingdom. And this is the Lord's response. And he said unto them, It is not for you, for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father had put in his own power. So in 1 Thessalonians chapter one of chapter 5, verse 1, when it talks about times and seasons, Paul is talking about the restoration of the kingdom to Israel. That's what he's talking about. He said, he said, you have, you know, you have, but you have no need uh, right now to know, you know, around the times of the seasons. But then he goes into verse 2. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. So Paul is tying in the times and the seasons with the day of the Lord. But notice he says there perfectly. That means I had great knowledge. And I'll, I'll, I talk many people. I go various places and talk. And so few people have any idea about what the day of the Lord is. What's it about? They don't have a clue. And Paul is saying here, the Thessalonians 2,000 years ago, they had great knowledge. They had tremendous knowledge of the day of the Lord. And here we are, I believe like our nose is sort of pressing up on the tribulation period now, and the day of the Lord, and so few have a clue about what the day of the Lord is, right. which I'm going to un un unravel, unpackage as we go on here. For uh, when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, they shall not escape. What is the cry today? Peace, peace. and safety. Mm -hmm. They want peace mm -hmm. and safety without Jesus Christ. Exactly. The, they want a worldly peace. Mm -hmm. They want uh, a nice economy that runs with no depression, you know, no economic mm -hmm. depression. Uh, no, there's no terrorism or anything like that. But there's no Lord in it. Right. See, it's all a manly type of thing. That's what the cry is. Peace and safety. Get those terrorists, whatever you need to do, take care of them and all. We want the economy going nice. Peace and safety. But again, without Jesus Christ, there will be no peace and safety. It can be a temporary type thing. It's sort of like a lull between wars type. But there will be none until the Prince of Peace comes. Amen. Amen. Right? Amen. And the Lord Jesus Christ smashes the Antichrist and his system. <coughs> the armies gathered at Armageddon and sets up his kingdom. Then there will be peace and safety. Hallelujah. When the Prince of Peace is ruling. Yes, right. But that's what the day, the day of the Lord, that, that's what the day of the Lord involves, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now look at this verse here in verse 4. <coughs> But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You see, we should be, because we're um, enlightened by the Holy Spirit, God says we're not in darkness. And that the day isn't going to overtake us, the day of the Lord. Mm -hmm. <coughs> the Holy Spirit wants us to know prophetically what's going on. Amen. It's not like, oh, I don't care about prophecy. Well, then why did God give it in the Bible? There's reasons for it. Amen. Amen. See, we're not in darkness. He's illuminated us. We see it. And one of the reasons I think that he's done that is to put fire on our belly, Pastor, right? When we see the hour we're in and all, it's like to seek the Lord. Lord, look at the hour. Look what's happening. I need power from on high to preach the gospel, the commission. Look, look at the prophetic hour. Lord, I need the power. See, that's one of the reasons that God wants us to be in tune to him prophetically. What's Amen. happening? Verse 5. But ye children are of the light and of the day, and the children of the day, we are not of the night nor of darkness. I want to be of the day. I don't, we don't want to be caught blindsided. 
God does not want us to be blindsided. But there's a couple things that can blindside us. Blindside us. Yeah. <laughs> is love of the world. If we love the world, that kills the anointing of the Holy Spirit in us. That's right. Uh, 1 John 2, 15 and 16. Uh, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, for all that is of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Amen. Amen. He that doeth the will of God abide it forever. So we, we, I use this world, Pastor. You use the world. I mean, we're in the world, right? We need finances. But my heart's not here. Your heart's not here. This isn't like accumulating wealth and power and prestige that the world offers. I use the world. I need money, you know? But I don't love the world. In fact, I can't stand the world, to tell you the truth. Amen. Amen. Just go out to the abortion centers for a while and yeah. look at it. Oh, if you love the world, there's something wrong. <laughs> Man. Television. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, we are not in darkness. So, the cares of the world, the love of the world, and the cares of the world will take the word, will be plucked up right out, of a, right out like that. Right. So, that the people don't see what's coming. When, when you love the world and you're full of the cares of the world, and all, it shuts down the anointing of the Holy Spirit right away. Yeah. Right away. And that's why, you know, the church, we're, we live in the Laodicean era. Exactly. And, and when you look at the Laodicean era, era in Genesis 3, uh, Revelation 3, right. what was the outstanding trait? Gold, silver, and their apparel. They love money. The Laodiceans. And that's the era we're in now. Really, the, hey, the, the church thinks it's doing real well if they've got these programs, it's all funded, and they've got money socked away, they think that, wow, look at God's blessings. Look at, look at the money we have. We have all these programs funded. And there isn't one ounce of God's power in the whole church. Exactly. There isn't a scintilla of God's presence. Mm -hmm. Laodicean will kill the anointing. Amen. Verse 7, uh, verse 6. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. You see, we, the church believers, can sleep if we get caught up in the world. And remember, the context here is the day of the Lord. But let us watch and be sober. Now, the word watch has to do, it's a military term, and it's like a, a, a sentry that's out there. And if, someone, if you're in a war and you're trying to sleep, let's say, don't you want good sentries out there that you can... Rest and, and you know not worry about enemies infiltrating. Amen. Amen. So that's the way God wants us to watch, to be alert. He wants us to be alert Amen. and to be looking. That's what, it's not like you're a sentry out there like this, and the whole you know the enemy is running, walking right past you. No, <coughs> would it be watching? And the word sober later on, Paul uses sober again. This is a very important word. Sober means clear thinking. Mm, you know, right. someone that's not sober minded. Like a drunk, I mean, they believe stupid things, they say stupid things, they do stupid things. Right. The next day, they don't remember what they said the night before, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. not being sober-minded. God wants us to be sober, clear, spiritually clear thinking. Watch and be sober. <laughs> For they that sleep in the night, and they that be drunken, are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day, in verse 8, be sober. That's the word sober again. And we know what I like about the Word of God. Uh, if God, it's 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 like a manual. Well, it's among among many things. It's like a manual. If you buy a new car, the new car will tell you. The manual will tell you what oil to get. It'll tell you what gas to use, tire inflation, tire size, how to inflate the tires. So you don't want to put diesel in a gas engine, right? And vice versa. Amen. So. The manual tells you how to take care and use the vehicle. Well, God's Word is like a manual. And if you look at it here, He says for us to be sober-minded. See, so in, um, in, 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 in verse 8, But let us so that they be sober. Then He tells us how to do it. It's like the manual. He doesn't say to be sober. He then gives us instructions. And it says, putting on the breastplate of faith. See, so... To be sober-minded with God and to be able to understand things prophetically, we got to live by faith. 
the scripture says without faith it's impossible to please God. Amen. That's right. That's right. So if we're not willing to like walk in faith and trust the Lord, you can't be sober minded. You'll be full of the cares of the world and fears and all sorts of stuff. And that 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 that, that you can't have a sound mind like that. So walking in faith is directly connected to being sober minded with the Lord. Amen. Now look at the next one. Uh, love. See, it's a breastplate that protects you. Love. Uh, this is a very important one because this world is designed to put hatred in us, bitterness in us, malice in us. So we can have parents that can provoke the kids to wrath. We can have brothers and sisters that hate each other, uh, kids that hate their parents, you know, all sorts of stuff going on. And in scriptures here, uh, it says that if we walk in hate, well, 1 John 2 tells us that you're in blindness and you hate. So if we, and, and what we have to do, be very, we have to be very careful because the devil can raise someone up to buffet us and to do horrible things that it could be easy to hate them for. And horrible things have been done to people. But if you harbor hate for that person, it takes it to another level in the spiritual realm. So when the Lord was on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. And he showed us forgiveness on the cross. So we have to forgive. Yes. Not like what happened. And sometimes we've got to go to God and say, God, I can't forgive for what happened, but I give it to you because you tell us to forgive. Yeah, and I don't want that hatred. I don't want bitterness in me. So the devil can raise you someone up to, to really hurt you and then take it to another level and put bitterness in you. And what does bitterness say? What does it say about bitterness? It defiles. Mm -hmm. Right. With defile. So you see what happens? Break it. If horrible things have been done, don't harbor it. Run and give it to the Lord. Amen. And say, Lord, you know, I can't forgive because what this person did, but I, I give it to you. Work in my heart to, to, to give me love. See, and when you do that, you're sober minded. Amen. Amen. So don't let the devil get you with that. You're buff, being buffeted and then ended up hating someone, then you get you, you, you're blinded with the Lord. Right. And the last one is hope. You see hope there, and the hope of salvation. Uh, and this is this is actually my favorite section of it. The hope is none other than the blessed hope. That's the hope of our salvation, looking for that blessed hope. Titus two thirteen, and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. That's the helmet. Right there. That's the hope. And when you got a helmet on like that, and this is all military type of thing, it protects you from a blow to the head. So if the devil can get the hope out of you, the next thing will come with the faith will be faith. Hope and faith go together. Mm. You see? So it's a chain. The devil goes after the hope first for you to give up, and then the faith goes. So here, to be sober minded, we keep in hope. And what is that hope? The coming of the Lord Jesus for his church. That's the blessed hope. Amen. And as long as you walk in that blessed hope, and don't take that off your eyes, as long as you don't take, uh, you keep it the blessed hope, uh, you'll be victorious in the Lord, and you'll be sober-minded. See, so that's the manual. Amen. To understand God's prophetic word, I believe to understand any of the word, really. But specifically here, it's the prophetic word. We need to walk in faith, love, that's the breastplate, and the blessed hope, that's to protect our head. And with that, we're sober-minded, and we can clearly understand God's prophetic word. Amen. It's not hard, is it, Pastor Ray? No, nope, not at all. No, you don't have to be a theologian to understand that. Sure. Faith. But boy, if it was theologians, we'd be in trouble. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, literally spelled out for you. Yeah, yeah, right there. There's the manual. Right there. Now, there's one other thing here, uh, in this here, it, 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 verse 8. Verse 8 and 9. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and a, hel and, and a helmet for the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, whether we wake or sleep. Now that's a reference back to chapter 14. We should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as as ye do. But look at verse 9. God has not appointed us to wrath. Well, what is, isn't that, isn't that when the day of the Lord comes, isn't that God's wrath? 
Yeah. But you see, he's not appointed us to it. Mm -hmm. And I've studied that. I said, but Lord, you're talking about the day of the Lord. You're telling us to look for it. But then you said you're not appointing us for the day of the wrath. I don't connect the two. And it's very simple. We're raptured before the day of the Lord. Amen. He wants us to look for it because he's coming for us before the day of the Lord. Because it says we're not appointed to wrath. That's what it says here. We're not appointed to the wrath of the tribulation. Amen. We're going to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen. And we return with the Lord yes. as the armies of heaven. I'm going to show you that um, hopefully a little later. But that's why we are to look for the day of the Lord because it means our redemption. It means that Jesus Christ is coming with us before the wrath is poured out. Because the, the tribulation period is the day of the Lord. Now, I want to show you in, in the Old Testament a couple scriptures, I guess for time-wise. Uh, there was a lot about the day of the Lord, but I want you to go to um, Zechariah chapter 12. Now, there are, when you study the scriptures, and like in Zechariah here, um, if you go to um, verse 3, chapter 12, verse 3, it says, in that day, uh, if you drop down to verse 8, in that day, it doesn't tell you there what it means by that day. But 90% of the time, maybe even higher, when you look at scriptures and you see that day, the day, it's a reference to the day of the Lord. And I'll show you shortly how in context this is the day of the Lord. So kind of have your spiritual antennas up when you're studying scripture and you see the day, the day is coming, the day of uh, fire. It, it, what is that day? As I said, 90, 95% of the time, it will be the day of the Lord. Occasionally, the scriptures will talk about like Nebuchadnezzar's judgment on, it, on Israel, ancient Israel, ancient Judah. And it talks about the day coming. Ooh. See, that's specific for that time. But generally, prophetically, when it says the day, the day of his wrath, that is the day of the Lord. So, Zechariah chapter 12, here, it is about the day of the Lord. In fact, I'll show you why. Go to verse chapter 14, and go look at verse 1, because 12, 13, and 14 are all together. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. Do you see that? The day of the Lord? Well, chapter 12 when it talks about the day of the day, it's leading into 14 verse 1 to tell you that it's the day of the Lord. Now, in scriptures, a good part of Matthew 24 is about the day of the Lord. Uh, Luke 21 is the day of the Lord. Mark chapter 13 is the day of the Lord. A good part of the book of Revelation, not all of it, but a good part of the book of Revelation is about the day of the Lord. Um, we just looked at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. That is about the day of the Lord. Zechariah chapter 12, 13, and 14, the day of the Lord. Um, Joel, the book of Joel, the day of the Lord. Whole chapters in Isaiah, Isaiah 13 through 36, it's like the, the day of the Lord. You see, that's, this is how important the day of the Lord is in scriptures. Obadiah, the book of Obadiah, the day of the Lord. So in here, when we look at the coming day of the Lord, and we get to um, Zechariah chapter 12, we get to, to verses 2 and 3. Behold, I'll make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all people round about, when they shall be in the siege, both against Judah and Jerusalem. And in that day I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. So what is the key? to the coming day of the Lord, Jerusalem. And almost certainly a week doesn't go by until Jerusalem is front page in the news. The Jews, the Jews go to build a couple hundred homes in Jerusalem, and the United Nations is condemning them. The Security Council is condemning them. Obama and Clinton are condemning them. The Arabs are going berserk, condemning them. They're talking about jihad. we got to take Jerusalem. Uh, the European Union is condemning them. Jerusalem. It's right there in front of us. The key is to the coming day of the Lord, Jerusalem. Amen. Amen. And the Jews are back in the land. Amen. You know, I, I want to put this in context. 
Uh, just hold on. Here's the Ernie, if we run out of time, I, I want to... Go as long as you want. We're just going to air the, uh, the best 45 minutes of this okay. on the radio station. Okay. All right. So, uh, most of us have grown up with Israel being a nation and Jerusalem there, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Drew, but, but think of this. Israel was out of existence. And we think of, well, the, the captivity in uh, what happened with, the, with Rome in 70 AD. But go back before that. Go back to 2,600 years to Babylon. And the Babylonians came. They destroyed Israel. They destroyed Jerusalem. They destroyed the temple. They killed, we don't know how many, a million, million and a half Jews, and took a remnant captive. Uh, that, was, in a, that was usually the end of a society. That was a common thing back then. But the Jews came back. Seventy years later, they came back. They rebuilt the, the nation. They rebuilt Jerusalem. They rebuilt the temple. They had lost the kingdom. You know, the kingdoms were now under the Gentiles. That started the, the age of the Gentiles that the Lord Jesus talked about. But, uh, and then 70, then um, 600 years later, the Romans did the same thing. The Romans come. The army destroys Israel. It destroys Jerusalem. It destroys the temple. The Jews are dispersed into all the world. And then in our lifetime, May 21st, 1948, Israel becomes a nation again. Unprecedented. They speak Hebrew. They use shekels for money. Jerusalem's the capital. See, that's the invisible hand of God. Amen. Amen. God has an everlasting covenant. You'll see it in Genesis 17, 7 and 8. Over with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their seed and over the land. And God has brought them back with his invisible hand based on that covenant. And they're back in the land. It isn't going to end. You know, it, it's not, I mean, it's not going to continue forever. The Jews are back in the land. Well, what happens? The second coming of Jesus Christ. Amen. Where is he coming? To Jerusalem. And all Israel is going to be saved. Paul writes about it. See, there's an end game here. And the events are heading towards this end game. The end game is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Isn't that exciting? Because yeah. yeah. I want to share, I want to show you from the word. That's how I'm going to end. When the Lord returns, um, what happens when he returns? Because it's very exciting for us. So, um, uh, oh, and I wanted to say two very important things happened in May 1948. May 14th, Israel was reborn as a nation, right? Well, guess what also happened in May 1948? May 21st, I was born. <laughs> and I'm, I'm gonna, I have a problem. What was more important? Israel becoming... <laughs> <laughs> so I tell people, look, if you look at me, and I'm real old and decrepit looking, then you can think, well, maybe Israel is you know, old and decrepit too. You know, hopefully I'm not decrepit looking. I don't feel old. But yeah, I was born May 21st, 1948. So it's two, two very important things happened in May 1948. So we go, um, we go now, I want you to look at uh, verse 4. And that day I will smite every horse with astonishment. Now, of course, the context is in Jerusalem and the day of the Lord. And every horse with astonishment and his rider with madness. Now, the horse with astonishment <coughs> might mean that much to us today, but this is a military term. Horses run to the battle. There's something about a horse. And, uh, of course, you have to go back in history and you've got to see the cavalry and all of that. But when the noise of the guns and the battle, horses don't run away. They run to it. And it says here they're going to be in astonishment. They're going to stop. Unusual things are happening. The riders with madness. Now, this is the context is Jerusalem. Aren't they mad over Jerusalem? I mean, mad, this is insane. Not angry mad. Aren't they insane? You know, the Jews, like I said, build some houses. The whole world is upset. Condemnation from, uh, well, it wasn't only Obama, it was Clinton, too, and Bush, and uh, the Carter. European, the, Carter, oh yeah, Jimmy Carter. I mean, the European Union, the Security Council, the, uh, uh, the General Assembly, they've gone mad over Jerusalem. Now, let me put it in context. If Washington, D.C. wanted to... A renewal program, or we'll say um, Columbus. I had to think, the capital of Ohio. Columbus. Columbus. Yes. Right. Um, if Columbus wanted a renewal project, and the United States, the rest of the United States was upset because Columbus was going to have a renewal, wouldn't we think that 
what, what does Pennsylvania care what Ohio does in its capital? Right. But this is the way it is with the world. Mm -hmm. It's Jerusalem. It's not any other city. It's Jerusalem. Amen. That's why they're upset. Amen. And this is eventually going to lead to the armies of the world militarily gathered there. It doesn't make sense. The Jews are going to build a thousand homes for Arabs too. Arabs are going to live in it. Why is the Security Council condemning it? Why is, you know, uh, Obama saying this is a crisis? Because it's Jerusalem. That's why. And we're heading towards the, the day of the Lord and the second coming of Jesus Christ. Um, go down to uh, uh, verse 6. And that day I will make the governors of Judah like a hearth of fire among the wood. And they torture fire and a sheep. Isn't that the way it is today? I, yep. Egypt is terrified of little Israel militarily. Syria is. You know, uh, uh, Iran. They all have to unify in a massive army to take out little Israel that's the size of New Jersey with like six million people. And the, the surrounding countries ha have to get these massive armies up. And, and they can't take Israel. It's like, it's like the Bible says here. It's like a, a fire and dry ground that will that will explode and burn up everything around them. And they shall devour all people round about on the right hand and on the left. And Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. Well, isn't Jerusalem the city again? Amen. And I've given this word many times to the Muslims because Muslims say that Jerusalem means Mecca. Seriously. And I say, well, let's go look what the Bible says. And I take from the verse 6. I said, no, in its own place. It's Jerusalem. Now, you go down to, um, uh, we'll go to verse 9. And it shall come to pass in that day, I will seek to destroy all nations that come against Jerusalem. The Lord himself is going to defend. And the Lord himself is the Lord Jesus Christ. And I will pour upon the house of David and, his, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Right there is all Israel being saved that uh, Paul talks about in Romans chapter 11. That's it. That all Israel, God is bringing them back. He's bringing all these circumstances to, about so that Israel as a nation is going to turn to him. Go to chapter 14. Behold, in that, behold, uh, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. Fire, I'll gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. Now, and it talks about the city is going to be taken and these things that are happening. Now, the reason God is gathering them to Jerusalem is because they're in unbelief. Mm -hmm. If the nations were in belief, they wouldn't come. Mm -hmm. You see? Right. If I was the President of the United States, the last thing I would do is say to the American army, okay, you go over and you take get involved in this war and take Jerusalem. I'd say, oh no, no, we're not moving. No, we're not coming against God's word. So why is God gathering them? Because they're in unbelief. That's why. If they're in belief, they wouldn't go. So all the nations are going to be gathered. There's this huge, I, I believe it's going to start in the north of Israel, in, uh, up, up by Megiddo, which the Bible calls Armageddon. It's going to spill down into Jerusalem. This, the, the city is almost going to be destroyed. Now look at verse 3. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations, as when he fought in the day of battle. The day of battle is when he fought Pharaoh. You see, when Israel is about to be destroyed, when they're, the armies the whole world are overrunning Israel and Jerusalem, they're going to call on the Lord. God is working these circumstances that I don't know exactly how. I have some ideas. But through prophecy and the witness of, of God's people and all, the Jews are finally going to put it all together. And they're going to see that Jesus Christ was their Messiah, and they're going to call upon him. Isn't that wonderful, Pastor? Amen. 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 Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Amen. In verse 4, and, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. Whose feet? Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and um, uh, that is his second coming, which is before Jerusalem on the east. Now, I want you to go back to Zechariah 12.10. And if you look at verse 10, it says, And I will pour upon the house of David the spirit of grace and supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. You see they're going to look upon him? But go to the 14 verse 4. 
and his feet shall stand that day upon the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is a huge mount. And he's going to stand there, and the, all of Israel is going to look upon him when they pierced. Do you see the connection between Zechariah 12.10 and Zechariah 14.4? They're going to see him when he's on the Mount of Olives. And then in verse, in verse 4 it says the Mount of Olives is going to cleave. Now, this is really important. It talks about the Mount of Olives cleaving. It's going to cleave east-west, and the mountain is going to move north-south. Now, not knowing Israeli geography, I, I didn't know what that meant. And it was a couple of years back, uh, there's an Israeli uh, tour guide that's a believer. He's also uh, very, um, he can interpret the, uh, the Bible from Biblical Hebrew to English. And we were talking about this because we were looking at the Mount of Olives. And I read this verse to him. And he said, well, let me show you how the Mount of Olives is going to split. He said, now, we were three miles from the Mount of Olives. He said, it's going to split over to where we are here. And north, it's going to go probably four or five miles. Wow. When the Mount of Olives splits, it's a huge mountain. It's not going to be a little crack. It's going to be huge. Amen. And all the Jews that are alive are going to run there. And they're going to get into that, that crevice. It, I don't know what you want, a rift. It's like a canyon. That's the best word. It's going to be a canyon. And there's a reason for it. Because I want you to look at verse uh, 12. And this shall be the plague with the Lord shall smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away. See, the Lord is going to smite them. This is not nuclear war. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and their flesh shall consume away while they stand on their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and the tongue consume, consume away in their mouth. When you look at, at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, what happens to the Antichrist at the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ? It says, with the brightness of his glory, and the shark coming at the sword out of his mouth, he's going to annihilate the Antichrist. See, this is what you've seen here, is the effect of the glory of Jesus Christ when he manifests his glory and the spoken word on unredeemed flesh. And that's why the Jews have to go into that canyon because as the Lord speaks it out, they need to be protected. Amen. They don't have glorified bodies like we do. Mm -hmm. Isn't that, see the picture? So here you go, the Lord Jesus is up on the top of the Mount of Olives in his glory. The mountain has split, the Jews are protected. He manifests his glory, it's like it's like a neutron bomb on flesh. You remember at the Mount of Transfiguration? The Lord had to shed His glory. Not shed it. He had to subdue it. They couldn't see it. They, he couldn't manifest His glory. It would consume everyone. And the Lord probably speaks the word. I don't know what it would be like. Be gone. And the Holy Spirit acts on the word. And the combination of His glory and the spoken word just melts on redeemed flesh. Amen. The battle will last a nanosecond. <laughs> they can't stand in His presence. Yeah. Now here's the good part. This is what I've been driving. That's good. It's all of it good. But Amen. I want you to go to verse 5 in chapter 14. And the first section is about the Jews fleeing to the valley that's created and all that. And I want you to go down to the end of that verse. And the Lord my God shall come. Now look at this. And all the saints with thee. Who are the saints? Who are the saints us. in that verse? Us. That's us. That's his church. You remember I said earlier about the day of the Lord? That the, uh, God wants us to be watching for the day of the Lord because we're not appointed to wrath? Here's the saints. It says it right there. The saints are returning with him. They weren't appointed for wrath. We weren't appointed for wrath. Do you see that? Yes. And the Lord thy God shall come in all. This, that's him with his bride. That's us. Can I hear a hallelujah? Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Doesn't this, this, now do you see why God wants us to know about the day of the Lord? Amen. He wants us to know the prophetic word? Yes. Amen. Isn't there like a quickening, like an exhortation? Like, I, I want to return with Him. Amen. Amen. Right? Revelation 19. That's, well, now you stole my thunder. <laughs> this is where we're going to end. Because we go to Revelation 19. In Revelation 19... And, and Zechariah 14 go together. When, when you read Revelation 19, I want you to um, always think of Zechariah 14. And when you read Zechariah 14, I want you to think of Revelation 19. Yes. Okay? So, here we go. We get into Revelation 19, chapter uh, verse 1. 
And it says, And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, out, Now notice in heaven. That's very important. Because some people claim that this is on earth. There's doctrines that say this, this is not on earth, this is in heaven. Saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath gathered the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornications, and avenged the blood of her servants uh, at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God at, um, that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Hallelujah. Now verse 5. For a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye servants, ye that fear him small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, not 144,000, but a great multitude, the voice of many waters, the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us rejoice, let us be glad and rejoice, and give honor unto him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Who's the wife? Us. Us. The church. The church. This is the bride. And I had, you know, I got to be quite frank with you, as a man, it's hard to be. Yeah. <laughs> now, for the ladies, it's no problem. Right. But and I realize this is gender neutral type thing. But it is hard. And I was preaching this one day, and I was in this church, and I said, you know, I can't. And I'm a big guy, and what about a wedding gown? So, some, woman, some woman in the back of the church hollers, "Don't worry, one size fits them all." <laughs> Can you picture him in a gown? Come on. <laughs> but anyways, ladies, I want you to know it is, as a man, it's hard to picture myself as a bride. But when it comes to the Lord Jesus, we'll make an exception. Amen. I said that in my class many times. Did you? Yeah. Yeah. But, um, so, the marriage supper of the Lamb, we're in heaven, there's the marriage supper of the Lamb, and then verse 6, and... and and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Sure, we reflect the, the glory of his righteousness. And he said unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. So we're in heaven, we're with the Lord Jesus Christ, we're at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Then you go down to verse 11, And I saw heaven open. This is after the marriage supper. And behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Then it goes on to describe the Lord Jesus Christ, and we come down to verse 16. Uh, uh, no, excuse me, uh, verse 14. And the armies which were in heaven with him uh, followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. There's the bride. Right here. At the coming of the Lord Jesus, the church is no longer called a bride, it's called the armies of heaven. Because he's coming back as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He's coming back as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He came as the Lamb, now he's coming as the Lion, and he refers to us as his armies. Amen. Because I believe the angelic beings are coming also. Right, Pastor? Right, we fight the armies of the world yeah. right there. Yeah. So we're with the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to see how that ties in with Zechariah 14. Amen. And the Lord thy God shall come and all the saints with thee. And the Lord's returning in Revelation 19 with the armies of heaven, mm -hmm. his church. And we come down to uh, verse 17 where the judgment starts. It continues in verse 18. Then we come down to verse 19. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth. There's the armies. And their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on of course, and against his army. That ties directly in with coming against Israel. And the beast was taken with him and the false prophet that wrought miracles before them, which were deceived, and, and that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These were both cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. That's how it ends. That's, you know, the battle, the Lord, just he speaks the word, he manifests his glory, the armies are defeated, the, the Antichrist and the false prophet are taken alive, and they're cast into hell. And we return with the Lord. The Lord is not coming 
for the church, he's coming with his church. Amen. Is that exciting? Yes. I mean, I didn't have to twist anything in the word and say, this doesn't mean this. That whole chapter, you just lay them out, you look at them. Well, the Lord's returning with the saints. We go to Revelation 19. We look at Revelation 19. Who are the saints he's coming with? His bride. It's right. It's after the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're in heaven with it. So these are exciting times, folks. Uh, use it as a word of exhortation. No downtime. Work for the Lord. Try and win the laws. Man. Hand out tracts. Stand for the... Ba if I knew the Lord was coming tomorrow or next week, I'd still go with the, to the abortion center. He doesn't Amen. want us to take downtime, right? Amen. That's right. He does work for the Lord to the end. Amen. No downtime. With God, there's no retirement. Now, only in heaven. Uh, one thing, one last thing when I close. I have just finished a track. It, to me, it's a very important track. It's titled uh, The 666 Surveillance System. Because Revelation 19 talks about the uh, mark of the beast. And uh, it's on my blog. If you go to um, my blog, johnmcturnan.name, and on the left-hand side, you'll see what's called The Last Trumpet, and it says uh, Printable Tracks. If you click on that, it'll take you, and you can see my track. It's called the 666 Surveillance System. I lay out with this whole technology. We think technology is wonderful. In a sense, it is, but it's building mousetrap, we're not going to be able to get out of it. Man will not be able to get out of it. They'll know everything about you. You won't be able to buy or sell. You won't be able to talk. Right now in Columbus, in the Columbus bus system, it's one of their, it's a, what do you call it, prototype. Uh, all the buses have microphones and cameras in it. And if you, if you whisper like this, they can hear it. Every sound that's made in the buses, and it, they're all being tied in to a nerve center, so you'll be videoed, every word you say, this is going nationwide. They're starting in Columbus and in Baltimore and some other city. Cleveland. Cleveland. They'll be all tied into this, and I write about this in my track. There's a massive com data commuter, data center being set up. They'll be online this year in oh, Fusion, uh, Utah. No, in Utah. It's the Utah data system. They, they, they can store 10 to the 24th power information. And they operate at 10 to the 15th power. The computers operate it. So they're taking ev everything. If you get a parking ticket, the books that you take out of the library, it's all going to the Utah Data Center. Tr money, tr what you do on computers, Google, Facebook, it's all going to the Utah Data Center. Uh, it's like a city. And they have these massive computers. And they want to bring them for real time, where everything will be online, everything you've ever done, and everything you've ever said. You probably even thought the way it's heading. That's what the world faces. The world faces Antichrist and Armageddon. We face Jesus Christ and his second is coming for us and the marriage supper of the Lamb. So go there and get the tracks out there geared for like the youth, the high tech people. Maybe we can win the loss. And at least open their eyes up if they ever go to take the mark of the beast. Amen. Well thank you, Pastor Ernie. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. got a 3DV set D, uh, with America's Fatal Mistakes. It doesn't have to be. And I don't know what you're asking for these, young. That's 20. $20, folks. Yeah, there's, so there's three in there. There's three DVDs in here, so they're here uh, after the service. I thank you very much.